Hubble is easily the most famous space telescope ever built in history. It's played an instrumental role in bringing astronomy into the 21st century and has inspired the general public with absolutely stunning pictures of planets, galaxies, and nebulae. In April 2020, Hubble celebrated 30 years of operation and can probably still provide a decade more of services as long as its electronics and gyroscopes stay in good shape. On the other side of the globe, China, which arguably has the world's second fastest developing space program at the moment, has decided to follow the footsteps of NASA and develop the Shuntian Space Telescope to be launched and deployed in low Earth orbit in 2023. So how does Shuntian compare to the legendary Hubble, and how relevant is this comparison? I'm Jean de Villa of the Dongfang Hour channel. Let's find out. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Let's start with some historical context on space telescopes. In past centuries and to this day, mankind has mostly been doing astronomy from the ground, from Han Dynasty imperial astronomers to Galileo, all the way to modern day observatories. And this makes sense because ground-based astronomy is much easier, it's more natural, it's more straightforward, and you can already get a wealth of information from just observing from the ground. But there are still some good reasons to observe from space, despite all the additional hassle and cost. You see, the Earth's atmosphere blocks a very significant part of the electromagnetic spectrum, meaning that gamma rays, X-rays, or infrared, for example, cannot be observed from the Earth's surface. And even for visible light where observations are possible, the atmosphere creates distortions due to its turbulent nature, limiting the resolution that telescopes can actually reach. And so to work around this, early ideas of space-based telescopes, so putting telescopes into space, started to emerge in the 1940s in parallel of the development of rocket technology. The first operational space telescope in history was the American Orbiting Astronomical Observatory 2, launched in 1968. And ever since, the US, as well as traditional space powers like Europe, like Russia, have sent many space telescopes to Earth's orbit and beyond, the most famous of them all being Hubble, although the James Webb Telescope has definitely been getting its moment of glory over the past few months. China, on the other hand, is rather new to space-based astronomy. Its space program started off only at a later stage in the 1950s and 60s, and while it has today a very thorough ground-based astronomy infrastructure such as their 500-meter aperture radio telescope, it's had very little experience with space telescopes. But the Chinese are planning to change this, and this is where Shuntian, a telescope project that was officially approved in 2010 and scheduled for launch next year, comes into play. Let's now compare China's future most ambitious space telescope with NASA's most iconic one, starting with size. Hubble is absolutely massive. The telescope weighs today 12.2 tons, has a maximum diameter of 4.2 meters, and measures a total length of 13.2 meters, roughly the equivalent of a large school bus. And finally, it's situated in low Earth orbit at an altitude of roughly 550 kilometers. In comparison, China's Shuntian telescope is actually quite similar. It's a bit heavier at 15.5 tons, has a similar length of 14 meters, and a max diameter of 4.5 meters. Shuntian also operates in low Earth orbits, although at a slightly lower altitude of 400 kilometers, which is less ideal due to the higher atmospheric effects. But there's a very specific reason the Chinese are doing this. It's because it puts the telescope in the same orbital plane as the Chinese space station, and we'll explain that in just a bit. So, so far, not that big a difference. Let's get into the crux of the matter with the optics. Hubble has a primary mirror with a diameter of 2.4 meters, a focal length of 57.6 meters, and a focal ratio of f24. Shuntian, on the other hand, has a smaller primary mirror of 2 meters, a focal length of 28 meters, and a focal ratio of f14. Now, what on earth did any of that just mean? Primary mirror size determines the level of detail that you're going to get, or in more technical terms, the angular resolution. 
Hubble's larger mirror enables a higher angular resolution at 0.05 arc seconds, which is very impressive. It enables Hubble to capture absolutely amazing detail on objects that have a very small field of view. So clearly, Hubble scores a point here, even though Shuntian's 2 meter diameter mirror still remains very good. Another point where Hubble has an advantage is pointing accuracy. Pointing accuracy is important because unlike on the ground where taking pictures just takes a fraction of a second, in space your pictures, also known as exposures, last hundreds of seconds. And so you really need to be able to point extremely accurately at your target to avoid blurring the result. And with a bigger mirror, Hubble also has more stringent pointing requirements to keep all of that additional angular resolution, which is why its pointing accuracy is at 0.007 arc seconds, which is like being able to capture a human hair from a mile's distance, according to NASA. On the other hand, Shuntian, with a smaller mirror, can accommodate a slightly lower pointing accuracy, which is at 0.12 to 0.15 arc seconds. Moving on, another key parameter of space telescopes is the field of view. In other words, the amount of sky that your telescope is able to capture in a single shot. And to show you what I mean, here are two pictures of the same target. And obviously you can see that the picture on the right captures a wider field of view, wider field of information. And this is an area where the Shuntian telescope really shines. Shuntian uses a three-mirror astigmat off-axis architecture, meaning that there are three mirrors that correct the light in succession before shining it on the sensor. And this solution reportedly enables a much larger field of view than the two-mirror Ritchie Coutier architecture used by Hubble, all else being equal. And this is something that you realize when you look at the camera sensors of both telescopes. The Shuntian telescope has a massive imaging sensor covering 234,000 square millimeters. That's literally half a meter over half a meter. And that's absolutely huge, especially when you compare it to Hubble's imaging instrument, the WFPC3, of which the CCD sensor easily fits into a person's hand. And this chip size difference is also reflected in the number of pixels. There are 2.5 billion pixels for Shuntian versus 16 million for Hubble's UVIS CCD sensor. Now, getting more into the nitty gritty numbers, the field of view of Shuntian is very large at 1.1 square degrees, as opposed to roughly 0.00315 square degrees for Hubble, in other words, roughly 300 times smaller. I configured these two fields of view in an astronomy simulation software called Stellarium and pointed both telescopes toward an object called the Eagle Nebula. And as you can see, Shintian captures almost the entire nebula, while Hubble only captures this little wisp of dust in the center. And this is actually a deep space target that Hubble has imaged in the past, and I'm sure that you've already seen. It's the very famous Pillars of Creation. And this is where we get to the most important part of this video, which is that distributing points between Hubble and Shuntian actually doesn't make any sense because these two telescopes were designed for different purposes. Hubble was designed to be a deep space telescope capturing very fine data on very small, very specific objects with fantastic resolution and pointing accuracy. And in that sense, Hubble absolutely fulfills its mission. Shuntian, on the other hand, is a survey telescope. It aims at establishing an astronomical survey of the celestial sphere, which is why it favors field of view over resolution. And surveying the skies will occupy the Shuntian telescope 70% of its time or seven years out of its 10 years lifespan, during which it aims at capturing 17,500 square degrees of sky, which is roughly 40% of the entire celestial globe. In comparison, if Hubble wanted to establish a map of a similar field of view, it would easily take decades and decades. Data coming from astronomical surveys of space is very precious for certain things like mapping out the distribution of dark matter in space, studying the history of the expansion of the universe, or detecting gravitational lensing effects like Einstein rings. And this is what Shuntian aims at doing. Another fun fact on this telescope is that the objective of the Shuntian Space Telescope is actually ingrained in its very name, because Shuntian in Chinese actually means to survey the sky. Of course, capturing such a big field of view at a high resolution creates a challenge in, the, in terms of the amount of data that's generated. 
Shunten will be capturing 50 petabytes of data over its 10 years lifespan, in other words, roughly 14 terabytes per day, as compared to the 150 gigabytes by Hubble downlinked every week. And so there's no doubt that China's ground stations and relay satellites will be working extra hard to downlink all this data to the ground. And finally, let's wrap up this episode with something that may seem unimportant, but that actually really makes a difference, which is how do both telescopes undergo maintenance? Two very different approaches were taken. Starting with Shuntian, it was designed initially to be directly part of the Chinese space station so that astronauts could directly manipulate the telescope and perform repairs, but this plan was scrapped due to the potential vibrations and other negative effects on the telescope. And so instead, Shuntian is to be put in the same orbit as the Chinese space station, in other words, at an altitude of 400 kilometers and an inclination of 41 degrees. So Shintian will live its own life as an independent space telescope most of the time, but can dock to one of the Chinese space station docking ports when necessary for maintenance operations. And this is why you can see a docking port on the Shintian Space Telescope when you look closely. Moving on to Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope was designed during the early years of the American Space Shuttle, an era where it was thought that the shuttle would provide frequent, reusable, and relatively cost-efficient trips to low Earth orbit. And this is why Hubble was designed to be serviced by the shuttle itself on a regular basis. And this was the case actually for many years. There were five trips in total since 1993 to perform repairs, the last one being in 2009 by Space Shuttle Atlantis. So both of these methods work in theory. The issue with Hubble's method is that, as you know, the Space Shuttle is no longer in service, meaning that the Hubble Space Telescope is at the mercy of any malfunction. And unfortunately, there's no way that the ISS could service Hubble because they are situated in different inclinations. But you know, so far Hubble is still fully operational, and so fingers crossed for that to last many more years. And so space telescopes are complex hardware and involve quite a bit of physics. We scratched the surface in this episode, but if you would like to go further, you can definitely do so with an interactive learning platform like Brilliant.org, who are kindly sponsoring this week's video. Brilliant is a fantastic tool where you can learn any science and engineering related subjects on your own in an interactive way, which makes the learning experience more entertaining than just watching lecture videos. Related to today's topic, there are courses like the basics of light and how light can behave like a wave, why stars have different colors, or how space telescopes can detect exoplanets with transits. Each concept is explained in an intuitive way, making the learning curve much less daunting and covering the basics all the way to the most advanced topics. You can use the link in the description below to start this learning process for free, and the first 200 listeners will also get 20% off the annual premium subscription, unlocking all the problem-solving courses and challenges. A big thanks to Brilliant for their support, and to you for watching this episode. And with that, I'll see you in the next video.